Hello everyone, hope you're doing fine. I'm gonna talk to you about pyramids and most of um, recording, management, and availability and export um, in pyramids and why is it useful on that work. It is important uh, to understand that obviously you record um, many tracks. Uh, FS, 2FS, 4FS, not um, But at the same time, once you record, you can also basically gain a lot of time by recording, for example, in different formats. I'm going to show you that. And then recording, hello, I just hear that the audio is very low. I'm surprised by that because I really enhanced it. And everybody was saying it was great. So I don't know what's happening. Just let me check quickly. Um, yes, I put quite a lot of gain on the top, but I just gonna gain it a little bit more even. Hope this is fine like this. Okay, good. So I'm continuing. And uh, the idea, thank you, Venice. Um, and the idea is that um, we're going to use some media markers for that. So it means that I'm going to apply some markers during my recording, not on the project, but on the medias. That means that somebody else will be able also to use those markers and have my notes. For example, uh, if there's a noise during a recording or a good take, bad take, or if somebody... Uh, uh, an instrument is out of pitch or whatever it is, some artistic notes, some technical notes, some editing notes, some and so on. And uh, then I'm going to show also that we have some background recorders, what we call background recorders. It means that for people who need to ingest to capture, for example, several streams, that could be one reason. But uh, the other reason is also that you could edit and record at the same time. Sorry, <laughs> reverse. You can record and edit at the same time. That means that um, for people who would do some broadcast show, for example, um, uh, 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 in, in, the, in the sense of some radio shows or some radio recording or TV, radio, audio, whatever, operas and things like that, where there's a grand opening or whatever, whatever it is, and then for broadcast reasons, you need the first few minutes or a little edit. So you can do that while you record, while you continue to record after the minute or the little blurb you want to send to air is done while the, record, while the recording continues in multi-track. And then what is very important as well, you can record those two different media sets. So it means that I can record one in my local drive, for example, and another one on my server, so I have a redundancy. Or I could also do it um, over uh, two locations for pure redundancy in terms that I can record that in, uh, I can record that, I can record that in, um, in two locations so that the producer could go away with the recording as well. I noticed there's some problem with my stream, and I don't know why. Um, can you send me a message if you can still see? Because I don't see that it works. Okay, I'm going to continue. Hopefully it's going to get it again. I start the stream and I stop the stream again. Let's see how this happens here. Sorry, obviously. Okay, sorry. Obviously, excuse me for that. Obviously, it seems that here at 6 p.m. and many people use the bandwidth, obviously, uh, to stream that. Um, so hopefully it continues. Please drop a... Thank you. 
please drop a message if something is wrong. And I continue. So the thing is that I was saying recording in two locations so that at the end of the recording, I don't need to make a copy of my media. Somebody like the producer or whoever it is can go away straight away with the, with the drive that was attached to my computer because I was recording at the same time locally and at the same time within the drive uh, that he or she brought and that was attached by a USB or whatever it is to my, to my device. Great. So let's start with the basics. Uh, first of all, I'm going to open my mixer, that you know now. And this mixer, um, first of all, I'm going to quickly explain how you can obviously set the inputs. This is something very basic. And then um, how to set up direct outs if you work with a console, for example. Um, here, I have on the bottom of each track, I have 48 tracks. This is the way I, I, I decided to work with but uh, 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 they're all here. And at the very bottom, I have my physical input. For the moment, I have internal buses because I feed a generator inside. So I have some, some, some stuff moving. You will see that in a while. And just below, I have my direct out, which can be post or pre. So here I would, con I would connect my console, for example, and post fader or pre fader in that. Uh, then I would go through the fader that you know, and I can send it in my mixer, in my purple mixer, if I want to have uh, summing in stereo, for example, uh, for something else or not. So here I can decide if I want this mono strip one in my master bus or not. Good. Now this generator connects in here and how do I can, how can I enable my direct outs and disable them? Sorry, I just have to do one thing is that to diminish the screen, I'm sorry, I have been a bit perturbed with this mess of connections. So I forgot to diminish my screen and you've seen the direct out. And now I continue with the rest of it. There we go here. So now what I'm going to explain is to go on to configure because this is here for each channel that I can enable or disable the direct out. And I can do that, of course, for one channel or for a number, number of channels. So I select from one to eight, for example, and uh, I can press control and shift and, for example, direct, direct out um, on or off for a number of channels if I select them properly. There we go. And now I can select them all together on and off. And then this is also a functionality where I can move things around, create strips and bustles and so on. And then I can also go, for example, to the route. So I'm just going to discard what I just did. Yes. Restore previous setup. There we go. And I can also go to the route tool. And the route tool is basically something that allows me to quickly connect my strips to a physical input, for example, or my strips, sorry, my physical outputs to the direct out or my physical outputs to the master output. So I can do it one by one by just clicking on the XLR I want to connect, or I can do it over route and uh, make it straight away like a routing tool very easily. Good. Now, of course, each of this track have to, has to be track armed, and now the signal is coming in because there's this internal bus connected from the output to the input here. And I can also individually for each of track, I can connect my auto input monitoring from those three positions. So it means that my track header auto input monitoring. So because I'm stopping, I'm having my input. Now if I play, obviously it will cut it, which is normal. Or I have it only always on play, so it only will read what's on the track. Or I have it constantly on input, so I usually won't read what's on the track. I have those different choices for each track or for all of them at the same time, if I wish so. Good. Now I'm going to press Shift, and I can change all of them at the same time. And I'm going to track arm, obviously, all my tracks at the same time. And before my recording, I might decide that my mixer is a bit perhaps too large, too big. I can minimize it like this. It pops up on my other screen, so I bring it back onto the main screen for you to see. Um, there we go. Come on. There we go. So it's minimized now. 
I am not such a fan of this minim minimized window. This is very personal, but therefore we have a meter bridge here. And this display is actually something just about perfect to be able to read it. So it means this is all my multi tracks. And if I deploy it there or I open it here, I can decide how many tracks I want to see. So not how many tracks I want to see, how many layers I want to see over each other. Either one layer, two layers, and so on. With the buses, without the buses. And I can see it with peak or with RMS or peak and RMS. So I can really decide the way I want it. Then I have my mixer settings. Um, I have my mixer settings here that I can choose from how I want to uh, design all of that on that aspect. And my meter bridge is available on that screen or I can move it, of course, around the way I want. I can make it much bigger or much smaller, really defined to the way I want uh, to be recorded. Great. I'm going to make it smaller. And I'm going to start recording. So obviously, recording, first of all, I can, oh, sorry, one thing important, last but not least, right-clicking on the track arming opens me my destination. It means my, my, the place where I will record for the moment into this folder. And I have the three, little three dots here that I can decide to create another folder, for example, if I want to record into another destination. I can give a name to my take. I can prefix this with a track name. So if for the moment my tracks are called one, two, three, four, five, but I can say piano left or, or ambi, whatever, or guitar or whatever it is. And I could prefix them with track name, but then I would record in one file per track, which is not necessarily what I want, depending on how I want to record and depending on what the bandwidth I have uh, uh, in my availability. And then in which format I do record into PMF, I mean, uncompressed file, PCM files, or uh, compressed files, which is obviously not very, very logical, but I could record in MP3 if I would like to. And then um, I have here different options. One that is very important is that, for example, prompt the name after recording means that when I'm recording, and I'm going to say stop recording with now, it will come up with this pop-up window. And this pop-up tells me, OK, how should I call this? Or is it a good take or is it a bad take? Or do you want to delete this take? And therefore, I can modify it or change it or say just number three and say enter. Great. But people sometimes don't want this little pop-up. And then you can simply, by here, disable it and press OK. And so the next time I record, I'm using the shortcut now to record, um, I will say stop. And it will just automatically uh, increment its take and bring me to the next one. So these are different little features and things you can manage. Good. One important thing before going to the next step, which is important for those working with timecode, because obviously some people will need to record some audio and at the same time capture some timecode to have a synchronicity with picture or because there are several rehearsals and several recordings. So first of all, you enable the incoming time code, either LTC or MTC, by saying chase down there. And now it is chasing. I don't receive anything. I don't have any time code for the moment here, but this is how you enable it. But what is very important is that how do you manage the time code, especially in a live environment? Because you receive a time code from, from another team, another crew, another truck, another whatever, and you, you can't manage it. So this time code might be good now, but it might not be good in half an hour. And of course, you don't want this time code to ruin your, your recording. So therefore, I go here into Job and Chase section, in this section, and you have the chase mode. And this chase mode allows you to define how you want, obviously, to chase the time code, either none, not chasing, either hard chase, which is the default setting in Pyramix. That means that it chases straight to the time code with a hard lock. That means that uh, if there's a little breach or a little jump in for whatever reason in the time code, the time code will stop and the recording will stop, which is not necessarily what you want in that situation. 
This is why you can go into soft chains. Then there, it had a certain tolerance to uh, a jump or to a little breach in the time code. Um, but nevertheless, if it goes a bit too hard or if the time code is stopped, the, the recording will stop as well. For your information, for those uh, doing archiving work and things like that, very speed helps you to record with a variation of time code. So that's, that's for another story. This is why you have here functionality that says stay in record until stop pressed. So it means that uh, once you're recording with the incoming time code, and even the time code stops at a certain point because of a certain reason, the system, Pyramix, will continue to record unless you tell it to, to stop the recording. And this is why you have to confirm that. So it's not because of the incoming time code that is not, not anymore available that it will stop your system. And then just below, you can, for, for various reasons, you can enable or disable the fact that it changes across midnight. Some devices will allow it, some will won't allow it, and this is why you can refine the system uh, in terms of its behavior about that aspect. Great. Now I make some recording, and I want to show you another tool that makes it suddenly much more flexible. This is how you can do it. So basically, start recording. Start my recording. Roger take five now. And actually, there's a window that is quite fun open here. Next to the to the paper that's called recording status. There you can obviously make it small and big in wherever you want and uh, on another screen or whatever. But this is my window where I can say actually to my producer which take it is. And because he or she never remembers, and you can put it right in front of them, so they can see how it is, and actually, you take five, in case whatever. And piano, and it is the take 31, sorry, 31. So now automatically it updates it while I'm recording it. And the moment I would stop the recording, it will, of course, implement the proper name on the clubs and on the file and on the media file. So this is one little tool or little behavior you have in the take logger that is very nice to you. Now, the next one, if I start the recording again, is that suddenly, actually, whoops, there was a false start. So you see here, there's a little flag that appeared, FS, false start. And that means that when I stop my recording, I will still keep my recording, of course, but I will see that uh, there is this little flag, and I will see, oh, actually, it starts here. So I can bring, I can trim my, 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 my entire timeline or whatever it is to the right point, or I could cut it, or I could trim it to in point, or trim it to the marker, or whatever it is, or whatever it, it, it is required on that aspect. But uh, I can very easily move those things around the way I want it. And then, coming much more interesting, I start my recording again. And again, I could have a false start, and actually, it's something bad. So it's a bad take. And so it means it stops my recording, it stops the recording, but I can handle this as a normal clip or normal file. I mean, I can edit it. I, uh-huh, you can't see it, sorry, back again. Excuse me for the trouble. It seems that there is a bit of bandwidth issues with my connection. Um, hopefully it goes again. Um, Obviously, I, I made several seminars where it was fine and I never had this issue. Nevertheless, I continue. Tell me again if it's, if it's bad. So the thing is that this bad take now can be handled like a normal, um, like a normal uh, clip, like a normal uh, uh, take, like a normal recording. Uh, it's just another color so that I see that it's a bad take, that I can then move back to a different color if I wanted to follow the track. So I just uh, right click on the clips and I say uh, display, background color, follow tracks, 
and then it will come back to a normal uh, take if suddenly I decide uh, that it's actually not a bad take but a long take. Good. Start recording again and now I'm coming to the important bit. I have here little emojis. Suddenly there was actually a good something happened and there something bad happened and now I can open those little markers and I can give a note to it. For example, there was a good solo. And here there was a chair noise. And now I can, of course, apply shortcuts to all of that. And now I can also say, whoops, uh, there was a problem with the pitch, for example, of the singer. Pitch. Okay, so I can take my notes. And those notes are, uh, are holded with the, with the media. So it means that when I will provide this, uh, this media recordings to uh, somebody else with a pyramix, all those notes will be available. So it means that, let me move a little bit back here, it means that uh, if I click on the clip, I can change the behavior of how they appear, those markers and so on. But uh, this is all customizable. But for example, the, the editor after my recording will see uh, straight away where is the good solo, where is the noise chair, where are things, and they can, of course, then very easily decide to just take a part or edit another part or, or, or remove something. And, and this makes it a very clear way, for example, just to edit this and keep this as a rough, as a rough uh, edit and then move forward to something else. So this is the recording in what we call basically the active project, the way it is here straight away recording in my Pyramix. Now I'm going to show you uh, how to set up and how to work with background recorders. So those background recorders, you go into settings, all settings, and once those settings are open, you go into background recorder, and this is how you set it up and how I'm going to explain what you're going to do with that. So first of all, you could set up several background recorders. I just do one for the purpose of the demonstration. And uh, I choose a green color because I want the clubs to be green and so on. I choose to follow the time of the day, or I could choose the time code also if I, if I would chase to an incoming time code. And first of all, I can hear the side of a pre-buffering. So it means that if I press record, it will have recorded 30 seconds before this moment uh, uh, of my recording. So I can reach back each time in case I forgot something. I can go up to 60 seconds, up to one minute. I can found stop if I want. And what is interesting here is that I can set two sets of recordings, but I will show you, I will show you that in a second. First of all, I have here the possibility either to edit in the active project while recording or nothing. So this is, for example, for people who will uh, ingest several streams at the same time. For, for example, you have some old tapes, analog or digital, and you have to play them in, in real time. So you can set up several different uh, recording tools like this, background recorders, and uh, you work and you edit on another project while in the background it's recorded. Uh, so you would say no or edit at the end of recording. So when you press stop recording, it will automatically pop into your active project and show you where it is and, and, and you can visually see that it's all good and confirm it. But what we're gonna do here is actually edit while recording. And I say, okay. And now I'm gonna open the transport bar and I see that now here, this recorder one is actually my background recorder on the top is my internal machine, basically, by Pyramix itself. And each time you add a new background recorder, it will add a new uh, layer there in terms of machines. And there we go. So now this background recorder starts to record somewhere. And I see progress in here. And I can, of course, delete something. I can make it fade. I can take a bit here, move it there, take another bit, move it there, make a cross fade, and listen to it because I'm in my active project. And then at the end, I could, if it's just, if this is a piece that needs, for example, to be aired before the end of the show, 
I can mix down it, put it into a stereo file and uh, send it to whoever you want or whoever is needed to. And of course, if I go now back to my uh, tape logger and I choose this time recorder, this is my recorder and as before, I can use this uh, like I used my little uh, emojis uh, before to take my media markers and my marks. Good. I'm going to stop the recording. And these are now my recordings, and now they behave exactly like uh, standard clips, uh, like the ones I recorded before. To show you one thing, I go into my media manager now. This is the recording I just did. And uh, I see that, um, where was it? Here, those pieces. I see that in my media manager, so in my record uh, uh, folder, I have here my different markers as well. So those media markers will move as well within the, 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 the recording that I have here. And I can, for example, what I just did now, just can with shift and control bring this part back because this is what I'm interested in, okay? With the several takes and so on and so on. Great. Now the interesting thing, going back to my uh, settings, which directly from my transport bar can be reached from here, from this little wheel, I can also open the mixer. And this mixer is actually my background record mixer with its own inputs, for example, that are, of course, independent and different than the inputs of my mixer because it's a background recorder, okay? So I want different inputs than my mixer in my project or I have no inputs in my mixer project, but I have uh, inputs in my background recorder mixer. This is why there's different, and this is why I have this green line on the top to really different, different shape. Then you remember, I, I chose the color green for this background recorder, number one, good. And here, this is the numbers of track I have activated, now eight tracks in this, in, in this case. And uh, this little wheel uh, brings me back to my uh, background recorder, uh, uh, settings and here now I decided to say number of media sets to record two and these are the settings for the record track or media set number one so that means that it's recorded in this folder it's a BWAV in 24 bits single media files or one file per track one file per bus and so on uh, and as we said edit while recording and now the media, the media set sorry number two is recorded in this other folder. Each time with the three dots here, you can whatever, choose another folder, create another folder, another destination, wherever you want to record to. That means that now everything I'm recording with this background recorder number one, like this, will be recorded in two destinations on two different drives. So let me just, uh, this is now the take number 12 of my P25, I say stop. And now if I go here, I see it is here in this folder, and it is also at the same time in my record two folder in two different locations at the same time. So there is a huge gain of copying, moving around uh, medias and whatever. I have them straight away in two, in two media locations as soon as I press stop. And this is an enormous gain of time in terms of copies, but also in terms of um, redundancy, because um, it happens rarely today. But in case a drive crashes, you always have it on the other drive uh, uh, for good reasons. Good. Now I um, explained a little bit how this background recorder is working, and now I'm going to bring in some material that um, that comes from. Uh, some, some, excuse me, some, uh, just gonna close this. I'm gonna bring in some uh, existing material, multi-track material, that I'm gonna bring in here and show you some basic editings and then how to export this material. First of all, control and shift, always the same thing. I can either drag and drop it like this, or I can um, drag and drop it, sorry, Broadcasting from the same computer as making this hard for the for the laptop, or so now I have this uh, this piece of tape or whatever it is here, 
And uh, I can also take another piece there, and this time I'm going to, for example, right-click on it, and I'm going to select Place, because I could say I want to place it to the cursor or to the electron time code. So for the moment, I put it to the cursor. I can do that also with several that are bringing at the same time, and then it will ask me, do you want to place them one after each other, or at the original time code, and so on and so on. Just gonna cancel that. Good. I made a crossfade here, and now I have a basic little edit. So it means that because I have a little edit, and I need now to export this. So I'm gonna look at a variation of possibilities. The first possibility would be to say project, and to say mix down. Mix down means that I'm going to bounce this. You remember I have a stereo mixer that is down here. Of course, I could have several or five, one or whatever it is. And now I mix down this into a new file. I can post process it, change the sample rate and so on in different file formats. And off you go. Great. Um, this would be the, the standard thing. The other thing is that I could say, actually, I'm going to render them because uh, I recorded in multi-track, uh, I made some edits, some very top and tail basics or whatever, and I need now to export it because another place, another location somewhere around the world is going to mix it or edit it first and then mix it. So I want to provide those rough files, but already pre-edited with my crossfade. So here I can say in my render tool, I want to export, sorry, to render them with no processing, so now. I can give a name if I want, but I can prefix them with track name. So it means now this number one is going to prefix in in uh, each of this file, but um, I could change my number one, of course, to piano left or instrument names or whatever it is uh, that can change. But it requires this time to do one file per track. And then I can say a new folder. I can choose another format if necessary. A resolution, one file per track, as we see, unique file name extension. This I generally disable it for an export, but it means that it will put an, another numbers of letters and uh, and uh, numbers behind the file name, so that uh, in case two file names have the same name, so it, it it's possible within the same folder. And now this is where it is the interesting part. I can do either the whole composition, or I can do the selection. So now it will do one file out of this cut times 48, because we have 48 channels and 48 tracks. Or I can do split by group. So that means if I would have two songs now, or two edits, and I want to make two different files out of it times 38, I can make a clip group out of this, and it will generate it immediately on that aspect, which makes it very interesting, because uh, 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 you gain a lot of time exporting multiple file formats in one go just by clip grouping them. I'm just going to go out of that and show you how you clip group. There we go, clip and group. So it means that if I say now this is my clip number one, my group number one, I'm just going to make a copy to make it easy like this, Control c Control v and I go into selection because that at the end is song one. These are my properties, right, of the clip, or the group clip router, song number two, and I can go here into my media manager, and now if I select those two guys, they're two groups, and now I could say that I would group them split by selection. So it means that it will export this individually as each time each file will call either song one or song two, track one, track two, track three, or the name of the instrument, if I would have given any name of the instruments. And so it is nice and neat that I can do all this export in one go. Great. Now, the other way of exporting, it is about um, often when you work with a console, for example, in a live environment, is that if you work in stereo or as a stereo master file, is that the last two tracks are the return of your console, of your mixer. So it is the case in this production where I have my track 47 and 48. Let me just remove this here. 
47 and 48 is actually the output of my console re-recorded back into my Pyramix. And now I would like to make an export just of those two as a stereo file because it is perhaps the final mix or it is needed and required for streaming or it is something that goes to the video, to video, video editor people if it's something with sound and picture and uh, they're going to edit it and I receive it back from which then I can reconform uh, my multi-track audio material. Good. So now for that, I'm going to um, go up here and right-click over there in the sense that I'm going to select everything, all the clips that are in between the marks. And that means that, um, I just have to click it, means that because they're grouped, that the whole timeline is selected. But when I select only one track or two tracks or the amount of tracks I want, I can do that very easily by just doing it with the first tracks. I can also use shortcuts if I want going up and down of those selections and move them down. So you're going to see that it's going to be perhaps easier like this with this screen and just toggle more down. There we go. Go down on my all my 48 tracks and like this there we go and we're gonna happen to that yes excuse me graphically it's a bit slow and then I repeat it because I broadcast from the same computer uh, where my Pyramix is located and it's a bit heavy for a little laptop great so now my two last tracks are selected and I can say project again as before render and I'm going to keep guide track mix from console, whatever. I'm going to say I'm going to put it in this folder, in wave, why not? One file per track, no. I want to make it stereo. Prefix with track, na track name, no. And selection. Yeah, great. Render. And now I'm going to make a render of this with my two last tracks that I can provide with the proper metadata, of course. Well, not here, if I would have done it in broadcast way. I gotta say undo because I don't want to pollute my timeline, but I have it here in my final export as a guide track in stereo. These are my track 47 and 48 from my um, initial recording in my initial multi track recording. Another way of exporting uh, material is that simply you go to your multi track recording and you simply press right click. And this is now without going through the timeline, because um, I recorded 48 tracks, and let's say I just want this raw material as it is to go into another format. So it means that uh, I don't need to bring it into my timeline, for example, to make a fade or to make a crossfade or whatever. I just can click export here. I select a new folder, uh, record two, for example, and I say OK. And then I choose the format in which I want to export. And again, I can say one file per track, flatten track numbers. I'm going to explain this in a second what it is, or you need file name extension, OK, or yes, or OK, or. And there, this is another way of exporting it, simply because I recorded, for example, in, in broadcast wave, and I want to record, sorry, to export some AIFF files. So just some basic file management handling. The flatten track number is very interesting. Let's say that yesterday we recorded um, this multi-track, and today we're going to make some re-recording, but not everyone is there. Just a few members of the band or the, the orchestra, whatever, and we're going to record track 7 and 8, and track 17, 19, and 21, and 22. It means that while I'm recording and while I'm making some punching punch out, uh, several tracks, whatever, in my media the tracks are remembered. I see this is recording now. It tells me track 8, 7, 8, 17, 19, 21, 22. That means that when I bring this media back into my project, I could have, of course, several takes and bring them back. It remembers with its metadata where they belong to, to which track they belong to. 
this is very interesting, uh, especially when you work within the pyramids, but this metadata might be mishandled also by some other DAWs. This is why you can disable it. Uh, sorry, where is it? Uh, it is, it is flatten track number. There we go, and I say okay. So you will see the difference now. When I'm recording here, the same insert, the same area, and of course, they behave in my timeline in the same place. But in the media, it tells me simply that I have six tracks, because the track 7, 8 makes 1, 2, 17, 19, 21, and 22, makes six tracks. So uh, if I bring it back into another timeline, like here, it will just bring them together. Okay, so uh, this is a very interesting way about how working with metadata, especially when you work with re-recording on that aspect. Great. This is a little bit all what I wanted to explain about uh, multi-track recording and the background recording and everything. Just going to make myself a little bit bigger again to say bye-bye and to wish you there we go. To say bye bye and to wish you a happy, a happy afternoon or evening, depending where you are. So have a good one and talk to you soon for the next webinar. Thank you very much. Bye bye.